Check out FlipSideGaming.com for all your gaming needs. Use the promo code HEROES to save 10% on all orders over $10 and support the channel at the same time. Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to part two of our six-part Ixalan full set review, and today we're going to look at all of the blue cards. Now, if you saw yesterday's video where we focused on the white cards, you kind of know what to expect here. We're going to look at each card. We're going to first and foremost talk about it from a limited point of view for draft and sealed, and then any cards that could cross over into other formats will definitely make mention of that as well. Now, with that being said, just a really fast reminder, if you're looking for a way to help support the channel and our content, just check out the description below. You'll find a link to our Patreon page. You'll find some product links to things on Amazon. If you make any purchases via those links, we get a small percentage. And then also Flipside Gaming has provided a promo code for our viewers so you can get a discount. They're actually doing pre-orders right now for Ixalan as well as Iconic Masters. You might want to check that out. So with that being said, let's get into the cards. And we're going to start off with a reprint, Air Elemental, one of my favorite old-timey cards from Alpha Beta Unlimited. Now, first thing I'm going to say about blue when it comes to your limited game, a couple of things you want to look for as we go through the video today. First off, you're going to see some merfolk, and they're, of course, a tribe. They feel like maybe a little bit of a weaker tribe. They're going to play well, of course, in Simic colors. You're going to see pirates, which feel like a pretty substantial tribe. They're going to be in Grixis colors. But the third thing you're going to see, which is a little bit interesting, is a strong focus on flying creatures. And this is a good example. This is not a merfolk. This is not a pirate. But it's a classic 4-4 four, four, flyer for 5. It's actually a good card for limited purposes. Not a card you'll necessarily see crossover to standard or anything. But it's a card that maybe I don't really want to first pick, but I wouldn't be extremely upset if I picked this like second, third, or fourth a lot of times in a pack. It's just a very solid, big evasion creature, and I like that. You're going to see cards that play well with flyers, like in a few moments we're going to look at another reprint, which is a classic card that buffs flyers. So think about that, especially if you're playing sealed and you can't get a cohesive tribe together, or you maybe have a really bad draft. You could just simply go like Azorius Flyers or something and put together a decent deck. So it is kind of an escape if things aren't going well. Arcane Adaptation. All right, this card is super sweet. A lot of you know the card Conspiracy, which is two black and three, and it turns everything you control basically and own into a certain creature type. This does the same thing for cheaper, but it actually adds the creature type. So you get the dual creature type and the advantage maybe of keeping the previous one. So this is going to be awesome for commander purposes. First and foremost, this is going to let you do things like maybe sprinkle slivers into a deck with other creatures and then they all get the benefit of slivers, things of that nature. A lot of different roads you can go with this card. When it comes to limited this might be okay, again, as another escape route if you just had a bad draft or maybe in sealed if you just have kind of a hodgepodge of different creature types and you have certain things that buff different creature types, then maybe this is playable, but it's not going to be for all builds. It's probably the exception to the rule more than the rule. It's definitely not something I'm going to first pick in draft or anything. It's something I pick up later if I'm in trouble, and I think it might help me a little bit. And as far as standard goes, I don't know if I really see utility for it there right now, but who knows, maybe in the future once we get the next set or something along those lines. Cancel. Hey, Cancel is another reprint. We've been seeing a lot of cancels with Upside recently, so I'm a little disappointed to just see Cancel back, but it is at Common this time, so that's kind of interesting. One thing you're going to have to remember about this set, because it is a tribal set, it's very creature and very aggro heavy, especially in blue. This is probably the most aggro blue we've maybe ever seen. So when it comes to protecting yourself in blue... Uh, these kind of work as removal spells maybe more than they even work as control spells, right? So if you're going to need something to deal with threats, cancel is a good choice for your limited game if you're in blue. It also has seen standard play in the past and could see standard play again in the future. Chart a course. Uh, this is a good limited card. I don't hate this one. I'm not picking it super early in draft. It's something you might be able to pick up later in a pack, but at the very worst, it replaces itself and lets you loot. That's actually not bad for two. It is sorcery speed, though. But aside from that, if you were to attack, basically this is a raid card that doesn't say raid on it. If you were to attack, then it replaces itself and lets you draw. So if you don't have a lot of other good card draw options, it's very, very playable. And remember, when you build those limited decks, yes, creatures are your biggest concern, followed by removal. After that, you do want to remember that it's important to have at least one or two draw spells to keep your deck moving and help you get through some tough times. And if this is what you got, this is what you got. 
Daring Saboteur. I actually like this pirate a lot. Uh, you can pay mana into it to make this unblockable, which is sweet, considering it's a 2-1 for 2. On top of it, if it can connect with the player, you get to loot. So even if you don't have the mana all the time to make this work, there's times where you could play this on turn 2 and get a free loot in. That's super sweet. And even if you can't do that later in the game, you can more consistently maybe pull that off if you can keep it alive. So I do think this is a really nice aggro card that allows you to work through your deck a little bit. Fantastic pickup. A lot of times first pickable, I think, in a lot of packs. And I do think this could see some standard play maybe in that pirate deck. I do feel like we will probably see a Grixis pirate deck in standard. Dead Eye Quartermaster. Uh, this one's all right. Like, this is good if you have a good piece of equipment that you want to be able to tutor for in limited. And I say equipment more than vehicle because there's not a lot of great vehicles in this set. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's one that's okay. But for the most part, I'm really thinking about equipment, things like Dowsing Dagger or stuff like that, which we're going to talk about later in the week, of course. They could be good. So if you want to consistently try to hit that particular card in your deck, then this is an okay pickup. Other than that, don't touch it. It's way under power toughness for a for a casting cost card if you're not using the ability. Deep Root Waters. Okay, first thing I want to say about this card is I don't really see it crossing into like modern legacy merfolk or anything. There's only one card today we're going to look at that I feel like has potential to do that. Now, aside from that, though, could this see standard play? I don't think right now. I think the problem with this card is it doesn't have enough merfolk support in the set. Maybe in the future with rivals, I kind of hope eventually they get more of a push because I'd like to see a merfolk deck in standard. But at least right now, I don't really feel it. This is good in draft, though, if you're looking to just draft a bunch of merfolk. And if you can pull that off, this is very runnable. I mean, I don't like playing a three casting cost enchantment that's not going to do anything on its own too much. But I'm okay with that as long as I have enough merfolk that I think will tempo me back to even rather quickly with a card like this. So if that's the case, I'm good to go. Probably a lot worse in sealed because most of the time you're not going to have a lot of merfolk. This isn't a card that's good with just a couple merfolk. <laughs> you want to make sure you can consistently hit that trigger. Depths of Desire. Uh, this is a good tempo card, like nothing super exciting about it. It does create a treasure. It costs three. It's an instant speed. I think that's reasonably costly considering you get the treasure and it is returned creature to its owner's hand. So you can use this to protect your stuff or tempo your opponent. Enough versatility here to make me feel pretty good about the card. And furthermore, if you're all in on a treasure plan, this complements that. And that could be a number of different things. We've seen some alternate win conditions that will be coming up in tomorrow's video, actually, that work with treasures. There's a card that you can take your treasures turn them into card draw it's also in tomorrow's video when we look at the black cards so there's different things you can do with treasures but simply you can also just color fix and temporarily ramp with them maybe that's good enough so this card becomes even better in those situations but it's very runnable regardless i think for limited maybe it's not one of the top one two three four picks in a pack but you can get this in the middle of the pack and you'll be happy to run one of these dive down it's a decent limited combat trick really for blue i like the fact that it's a defensive trick it gives it hex proof and some extra toughness you can deal with something like a direct damage spell or maybe a destroy spell that's coming at you so nice to run one of these sometimes in your limited builds dream caller siren okay i like this one a lot it's a pirate it's a 3-3 flyer with flash they tried to give it a little bit of a drawback saying okay can only block creatures with flying but that's okay this isn't about blocking this is about fighting this is getting in with your pirates doing damage getting abilities for raid, that type of thing, right? Now, when this enters the battlefield, you also, as long as you control another pirate, can tap up to two target non-land permanents. So again, it just helps you get that extra damage across. It helps you be super aggressive with those pirates. It also works well with merfolk, because even though merfolk aren't quite as maybe aggressive as pirates, they're a little more tricky, and they're trying to find different ways to get their damage across. A lot of times they're smaller creatures. You're going to see that as we go through. So a card like this can actually help them along quite a bit, too. It also fits into that whole flyer side game that I was talking about earlier, which maybe sometimes you end up just drafting a bunch of good flyers, and that could be a deck, too. <laughs> so, yes, this is easily first pickable. And as a matter of fact, this card is so good. I think this is one of the key reasons I believe we will see like a Grixis pirate deck. It's definitely standard playable. Fantastic card just overall. And you know what? If you can swing the color requirements, which isn't going to be possible for every build, but even a vampire deck would like something like this. So it might be hard with the double blue, but if you can make it work, like <laughs> it's not out of the question. 
All right, Entrancing Melody. Uh, this is a Control Magic spell. It's going to cost you a little more in most cases because you do have to pay X based on the current amount of cost of the creature you're taking. However, I don't think that's that bad for limited purposes. I still think this is first pickable in a lot of packs in draft. That can be a big swing. I mean, stealing your opponent's creature, their best creature anyway, is sometimes a huge swing and allows you to win games. We can see just even when you play cubes how good cards like Control Magic can be, right? Like nothing different here in this particular limited environment I think could be very good. Favorable Wins. Okay, this is a reprint. I've been alluding to this a little bit, but this is the card, of course, that's going to buff your flying creatures. This is a good card for two mana. It's an enchantment. It could instantly give you some value depending on what you have on the board. I do like that. There's a lot of good flyers in blue. There's some good flyers we saw yesterday in white, amongst some others in other colors. So there's a lot of different things you can do with this card. It's uncommon. If you're lucky, maybe you can draft a couple of them if things are going your way. So yeah, really sweet card. This has seen some fringe modern play in the past. There's actually a budget modern deck that Saffron Olive just put out that revolves around this card that looks super sweet. <laughs> and I do think this could see standard play as well. Fleet Swallower. All right, let's talk about some mill. I actually like this card. It costs seven, but you get a six, six out of it. When it attacks, it has a traumatize effect, which you could use on yourself. Sometimes it'll be relevant, maybe in games like Commander, but definitely for limited purposes, you'll probably want to hit your opponent with this because it could take a big chunk of their deck. When you're talking 40 card decks and you're looking at half of what's left, that could be a lot of cards, at least in a lot of circumstances. It starts to put them on a clock. And you don't even have to connect with the damage. You just simply attack. So even if your opponent has two three threes, they joint block this, they lose half their library, and they lost two creatures, and you're in a pretty good position at that point probably, right? So I feel like this is first pickable. Really interesting card for draft or for sealed. Beyond that, I'd like to try this out a little bit in Commander. It seems like it could be fun there. I think it's a little too expensive for Standard, though. Headwater Centuries. Uh, here's a Vanilla Merfolk. There's not too much to say about this one. If you're playing Merfolk, it could be a good complement, a nice curve filler for that deck. It's also a good blocker if you're trying to slow things down a little bit. Herald of Secret Streams. Now, here's an example of what I was talking about earlier. Creatures you control with a plus one, plus one counter on them can't be blocked. This is how merfolk are getting their damage across. And this works well with not just merfolk, but other explorer creatures and such. So this is a card that's very, very runnable, even if you're not all in on merfolk. So this could be a good sealed card for you some of the time. Also, I think it's first pickable in a lot of packs and draft. It may be... In the future, could see some standard play. It just depends on what develops with the Explorer and maybe even the Merfolk Tribe in the next set, I think. Finally, Commander. Plus one, plus one, breed lethality style decks and Commander. They'd love to have something like this. Jace Cunning Castaway. Okay, some people are a little hard on Jace because they felt like power level wise, he wasn't doing enough. But for three mana, I actually like this card a lot. I'm pretty high on it. And I think this could actually see play in standard, maybe in the pirate deck. That first ability is a little dependent, of course, on you attacking. Sort of feels like raid a little bit, right? So whenever one or more creatures you control deals combat damage to a player, then you get to loot. So I like the idea of that. But what I really like is the fact that that minus five, if you can get there and start doubling Jace, that can be real annoying real quick for your opponent. So even if you have to sacrifice this one to get two different ones, that's annoying. If you happen to be able to keep this one, now you're up to three Jaces. That's super annoying. So I don't know. I, I feel like there's definitely a lot of possibilities behind this card considering its cheap casting cost. If this costs four, I probably wouldn't be as high on it, but at three, I feel pretty good. Also, there's ability to at least sort of defend itself with that minus two ability part of the time, and I do like that. So this is first pickable easily in most draft packs. I mean, again, it's a Planeswalker. Planeswalkers and Limited are going to be great. Even the worst ones are going to be great, <laughs> so you don't really have to think too much about it. Overall, I think it's a good card. Kopala Warden of Waves. This is the one card I alluded to earlier that is a merfolk that I could see maybe trying out in a modern or even legacy build. I think in some ways this is better in those formats because mana is going to be a little more restricted, especially when you get to like legacy. So I don't know, could get there. If not, maybe in the future in standard, once we see rivals, there's more pieces to merfolk. Maybe this card gets a little bit better. It's good in draft if you're drafting a whole bunch of merfolk. It's probably not quite as good in like sealed or if you don't have a lot of merfolk, it might not be worth running at that point but at least for a merfolk heavy draft build yeah it's a good card lookouts dispersal fantastic instance 
counterspell card for standard and also for limited. Now, if you have a pirate, this is a souped up mana leak. That's super sweet. If you don't, it still costs three opponent has to pay for it's actually still a pretty good card so i like this card a lot i think this will see standard play definitely in the pirate deck and you can play this with or without pirates and limited and be real happy with it navigator's rune okay this is a mill card free mill fans out there can't mill yourself so keep that in mind but you could play this on turn three or later and actually get an activation on the turn you play it that's kind of nice and in limited with 40 card decks this could be kind of damaging I don't know if it's for every build. I mean, you'll want to be able to attack pretty aggressively. Some ways I feel like this might even be better in the vampire deck, <laughs> but I think it could be good for pirates. It could be good in vampire decks if you could splash for this or something like that. But just generally, if you have even duplicates of these, like a second one, it's going to work even better at times. It works well with the big creature we just saw a few moments ago. So I don't know. I don't think it's for every build. It's not a strategy you're going to use in every deck. But if you happen to get a couple of these and you feel like you want to put some pressure and put a clock on your opponent, it's not a bad thing to run some of the time. One with the wind. I'm usually not a big fan of enchantment auras that don't protect themselves, protect the creature, replace themselves, things of that nature. This one, I don't hate. You might be surprised to hear me say that if you listen to a lot of my other videos, but I don't hate this one. The reason I don't hate it is because it only costs two and has a pretty good effect. Plus two, plus two, and flying is decent. So here's my thought on this. Play smart. Don't just throw this on a creature when your opponent is all untapped and they might have an instant removal spell and you get two for one. But when your opponent's tapped out and you have an opportunity to attack, maybe in the air, put this on a big old dinosaur and get in there for some damage. And that way, when they untap, if they destroy it, well, you still got some value out of it. You did get two for one card wise, but it doesn't matter because you put the damage across. So, yes, just be smart and you can play. I'll give you permission this time to play this aura, <laughs> but just think about it. Be smart about it. Opt. Okay, I love Opt. Uh, great card from Invasion. It's never been reprinted before. This is modern playable. I know I usually don't start with modern, but I'm going right there. Modern playable. The card is going to be phenomenal for any blue deck that's trying to get through its deck faster. Great for control decks. This will see standard play. Now, for limited purposes, this is a good card. I mean, don't overdo it because, again, the big focus on your limited decks is going to be creatures and removal. I mean, don't compromise those for this. But a one of and a deck, I think it's good just to kind of help you move through things. Overflowing Insight. Um, it's expensive. <laughs> it's three blue and four, but you are drawing seven cards. This one's also a mythic, I should point out. It's good in Commander. Like, I'd be happy to play this in Commander where I feel like it's a little easier to swing that casting cost and the game's going to move at a different tempo. The only way I see this getting some standard play is with a really significant, consistent ramp strategy, which I don't know is going to be there at this point. If it is at some point down the road, maybe this sees a tad bit of standard play, but it's a little risky at that casting cost, I think. Beyond that, limited, if your deck can cast it, then yeah, I'd play it. Like the deal here is it's a little expensive, but if you can ramp, maybe use your treasure tokens and such to ramp into something like this, it's a good target. And there's not a ton of great targets in blue to ramp into. I mean, we'll see some in other colors, obviously, especially when we're talking dinosaurs. But when we're talking blue, there's not a lot of big things out there. So this is a decent one. And hey, drawing seven cards can make a big difference. Now, if you can't consistently cast this in your build then don't run it you don't want this stuck in your hand but if you feel like you can it's a good card to run in limited perilous voyage another good tempo play and notice this time they said target non-land permanent you don't control they don't want you bouncing your snapcaster mage and scrying and pulling off those kind of shenanigans with this <laughs> so they didn't go there with it but it's still a good card for limited. Only two to cast. It's instant speed. Return target now land permanent. You don't control to your owner's hand. Some of the time you get to scry two. If not, it's still a nice little tempo play. Like running one of these in a deck for limited. Pirate's Prize. This is actually a decent limited draw spell. It's four. It's sorcery speed. But you're making up a little bit of that. Because you're getting to create the treasure token. Which even if you're not doing something degenerate with those tokens. Like just still being able to use that for mana. Is pretty exciting. And you get to draw the two cards. So it replaces itself. And gives you another card. I actually like this a lot. And I mentioned it earlier. I mean don't forget about these card draw spells. Use the ones you can. And if this is the one you got. You'll be happy to run it. Prosperous Pirates. If you play this, you have an ulterior motive. Like, you're not playing a 3-4 for 5. You're playing this for the treasure token 
And if you have stuff to do with the treasure token, then play this card. It will be good for you. If you don't have really good things to do with the treasure tokens, whether that's color fixing, ramp, some other like trick that you have in another card, then yeah, skip this one. But it's going to be fine in some builds. River Sneak. Uh, this is a merfolk that can't be blocked. So I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. Now it's a 1-1 one, one for 2. That's a little disappointing in some ways. If this was a 2-2, two, two, this could see play maybe even in Modern Legacy. But as a 1-1, one, one, I think it's a little bit fragile. It does get a temporary buff when you play another merfolk. So that's kind of nice. But what this card really wants to do, I think, is be a vehicle for cards like Dowsing Dagger, which, again, we're going to look at later in the week. But anything that says, like, you're going to be able to do something when you get damage across matters or even to turn on raid with pirates this actually works really good with pirates because sometimes you might not have a good attack line to turn on raid this gives you a lot more options for a good attack line so that's why it exists it's not going to be in all builds necessarily but i think it does work well with a lot of cards in the set so i think a lot of times you'll be surprised and find yourself playing this River's Rebuke. I like this a lot. This is a great big tempo spell for blue, right? Return all non-land permanents target player controls to their owner's hand. It can be yourself if that becomes relevant at any time, but for the most part, since it's at sorcery speed, it's probably going to be your opponent's stuff, and that could be good enough to win a game. I think this is actually first pickable in a draft. Run aground. Uh, do you want to temple your opponent a little bit for forward instant speed? If so, this is a good card for you. This is actually very runnable again in limited, like a one of, probably no more than that. But I do like at times if you're getting your opponent to stumble a little bit and you're pulling ahead, this can be backbreaking because not only are you taking away this artifact or creature, but you're making that their next draw. That can really hurt if they're looking for an out. So I like these kind of cards. Again, don't overdo it. Make sure you're not compromising actual removal or some significant creatures at the four spot for this. But when you can play it, you'll be happy with it, I think. Sailor of Means, uh, this is a good blocker. So even if you don't care about the treasure tokens in your build, I'm happy to grab this maybe as a 1-4 blocker if I'm trying to slow down the game, or maybe I side it in against an aggressive build, and it's especially good if I care about treasure tokens. Alright, search for Azkanta, and that transforms into Azkanta the Sunken Ruin. Fantastic card for control decks. Let's talk about limited first. I do think it's a little awkward and limited. I think very, very rarely will you want to play this in draft or sealed. I mean, every once in a while you get that deck that has a lot of important non-creature, non-land spells in it that you actually care about. But most of the time those decks are pretty creature heavy, right? So it's not going to be great there 99% of the time. However, control decks, maybe in standard, I think they would love this because you can mill yourself a little bit at the beginning to try to hit threshold. Now, it's a May ability, so if you turn the card and you don't want to throw it in the graveyard, you don't have to. But I do think control decks are going to have a lot of removal spells, a lot of counter magic. They're going to start filling up the graveyard early on. It shouldn't be too hard to flip this. Once you do, it gives you an engine to keep looking for more control cards, more removal spells, more counter magic, and it kind of feeds on itself. That's really, really sweet, I think. It also taps for mana, which is important for a lot of control decks, too. So I do think this will see standard play. I think this potentially will see modern, maybe even legacy play, too. In a lot of ways, the card maybe gets better in those formats because the targets get better. So yeah, this is really super sweet. Very exciting card. This is great in Commander, too, if you have a lot of big spells, big sorceries or instants or some crazy artifacts or planeswalkers or anything like that you want to hit. Shaper Apprentice, another cheap merfolk that face value isn't great being a 2-1 for 2, but if you have another merfolk, giving it flying becomes a little bit better. That's what merfolk are all about. It's almost this game of just gradual increases, and eventually they surprise your opponent. That's basically what they're trying to do here. This card fits that category. It's also a 2-drop. Sometimes you're just desperate for 2-drops, so a 2-1 for 2, if you have nothing better, is very playable too. Shipwreck Looter, another 2-1 two, for 2. This time, if you were to attack this turn, then you get to loot when it enters the battlefield. Again, serviceable 2-drop. It's not always going to make your build, but a lot of times it'll be just fine if you need one. Shore Keeper. Okay, this is a Trilobite. You probably didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> so Trilobite is now a creature type, apparently. Uh, but aside from that, this is actually a good card. I like this a lot. It's like, it's a common. You don't have to pick it up real early in a pack, necessarily. you probably find these a little bit later. But a 0-3 for 1 helps defend you. Again, sometimes you might just board this in against an aggressive build. But what I really like is later in the game, if it's still alive and I didn't need to really chump block with it or something... 
then I can pay eight, tap, sacrifice it, and draw three cards. Yes, yeah, sign me up. When I'm in a board stall and I just have a bunch of mana or I start drawing too much mana and I'm looking for some heat, this card's kind of there for you. So I do think it's a little too high of a cost for the effect for like standard, but for limited purposes, I'd be happy to run one, maybe even two of these in deck, depending on what I'm trying to do and how much I want to gum up the ground. Siren Lookout. Here's another Siren Pirate with flying, as a matter of fact. This one's a smaller one, a 1-2 for 3, but it explores, so some of the time it's a 2-3, but even if it's not, you still got to explore, which to me makes this a really good card. I'm actually really happy to play this in my 3 spot, maybe even a couple of them in a deck. Siren Storm Tamer. Okay, here's a one drop, and we've seen a lot of one drops in the set. That is a sub theme of the set generally. This is a good one. I mean, we've seen cards like this in the past. We've actually seen cards like this in the past that aren't as good as this one, quite honestly, and they've seen play even in modern. So I do think this has a little bit of modern potential. It's definitely a standard potential. And just generally, this is a fine card for you in limited as well. Now, in limited, yes, creatures are going to be maybe the dominant thing your opponent's putting out. But countering a target spell or, or ability, notice, or ability, that's a very relevant, that targets you or a creature control, I mean, that's a removal spell, right? So being able to put this out and making your opponent have to think twice about how they're going to get rid of your stuff or attack you directly with maybe a sorcery or instant, I think it's worth the one mana. And all the while, you can just ping away at them if they don't have a block or two. So maybe not first pickable, but I would not be sad to pick this up. Number two, number three, number four in a pack. Siren's Ruse. This is a flicker effect. I think this is the only flicker effect in the set. And it only can target something you control. So keep that in mind, a creature you control. But you get a bonus if it's a pirate, so you get to draw a card that's kind of sweet, so it will replace itself. But maybe more importantly, what this card's going to do for you is protect your stuff or let you exploit a good enters the battlefield effect. So there's a lot of different versatile uses for this and probably a lot of different builds. You'll be happy to run one of these a lot of the time in Limited. Spell Pierce. All right, we know what Spell Pierce does. It's real good. This, of course, is a reprint. Great modern card, especially good in formats that have a little more restrictive mana. Formats that are trying to be super economical, super aggressive, right? But I do think it's still good in standard, especially as a sideboard card, maybe for control decks. But regardless, this card is definitely going to see standard play, and it's okay for you in limited as well. It's counter target non creature spell, so again, it's not going to hit everything, but it could surprise your opponent if they're trying to pull off a removal spell or something like that. I wouldn't mind running a one of. Spell Swindle. This one's a little weird. I get what they're trying to do here. They're trying to make a fixed mana drain, but I have to kind of ask myself at the end of the day it's a hard counter for five. A lot of the time, would I just rather play cancel? It just depends on if I need the mana or not. I mean, some control decks might appreciate the mana boost, but if you build your control deck well, hopefully you won't need that because considering I can play this for five and maybe get some treasure tokens, or I could just play a cancel for three, right? Like, it almost feels like the same in the wash and early game, the cancel is better than this. So I kind of wonder how much play this actually does see. I do think it will see some play in standard. It will definitely see commander play. I think it's better in commander because you could hose some huge thing and get tons of mana off of it. That could be really sweet. And I love the fact that it comes in the form of treasure token so you can bank the mana. You can take mana of any color out of it. So in some ways that's even better than mana drain, but of course you are paying more for the spell. So I like the card. I like the design. I think it's a very good card. I do think it will see some standard play. It just might not see as much as maybe some people are anticipating. And aside from that, great commander. I would play this again in limited probably for most builds because again, blue doesn't have a lot of removal options. So this is basically removal. The card's a lot better if you have something to do again with the treasure tokens, right? If you have a payoff for those, wonderful. The card becomes probably that much better. And maybe that's something that happens at standard at some point. But for the most part, yeah, you'll play this. You'll be happy with it. I'd probably first pick it still. Historically, Aerialist, another small flyer that potentially could be a little bigger. Cost two for a one-two flyer. I think that's just fine. And then if it happens to, in certain circumstances, be a two-three, well, wonderful. It's actually great value. So I think this has potential to be a relatively high pick in a pack, especially if you're all in on an aggressive build like Pirates or maybe even some other builds. And beyond that, 
Also a card that maybe could see a little bit of standard play is just an early aggressive drop in a pirate deck. Stormfleet Spy, of course, another raid card here. This one letting you draw a card, which, again, has some nice value attached to it. You want to hopefully be in a pretty aggressive build when you play this, though, because you don't want a 2-2 for 3. You really want to be able to draw the card, but it's a good card for limited purposes. Storm Sculptor, another merfolk that can't be blocked. 3-2 this time, though. Costs 4, and yes, they're trying to hit your board state a little bit by making you return a creature control to your owner's hand. The benefit, though, is this turns on Raid. It also helps with, like we mentioned before, cards like Dowsing Dagger. So there's a lot of benefit you can get out of this card, and doing 3 damage every time, that's significant. Like, your opponent has to deal with this, and they kind of have to deal with it relatively quickly, <laughs> or else they're in trouble. Also, you can twist around that drawback a little bit. If you have a card with a good entrance battlefield effect, for example, and you put that into play, well, maybe you can at least get some benefit out of that too. So overall, I do like this card for limited purposes. Could be a relatively high pick for me. Tempest Caller. All right, another big play for Merfolk here. It's a 2-3 for 4, but when it enters the battlefield, tap all creatures target opponent controls. Now, this would be a good one to pick up with that last card, right? So this is a huge play. It's great for pirates. It's great for Merfolk. And again, if you can swing the two blue, vampires would love to have something like this. Not every deck can do that, but I feel like it could potentially every once in a while work out for you. Now, aside for that, could this see some standard play? Maybe, maybe in the pirate deck. Again, you're looking at an aggressive deck that might be looking for a way to close out a game. Perhaps this is one of the options. Water Trap Weaver. Uh, we've seen these type of cards before. They're good. Feels like it's exactly what Merfolk want to do. Tap something down, make attacking a little bit easier for the smaller creatures and for the raid creatures and such. And it's a 2-2 for 3, but that freeze effect is pretty nice. Windstrider. It's a flyer, so you get another flyer. This one has flash. Costs five, it's a three three, but I'm okay with that with a flash. It's also a merfolk if that's relevant for you. So yeah, ultimately just a fine limited curve filler, which has some evasion to it, works well with a lot of the other cards we've seen today. All right, with that being said, those are all the blue cards. So we got through a couple parts now. We're going to be back tomorrow looking at all of the Ixalan cards in black. But until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.